as a happy survivor of cancer, I have an outrageous theory to propose that medical science has reached its limits. In other words, it can no longer improve the human condition. And you may say this is ridiculous because we're having all sorts of medical advances all the time. We're, we're uh, making inroads into heart, heart disease and, and cancer and we're, uh, we're saving a lot more people than we used to. So how can I say that medical science isn't working anymore? Well, because for every advance in medical science, there is something else that is bringing down the health of the general population. Most importantly, the cost of all this medical care means that fewer people have access to medical care. So in the long run, we may be saving fewer people. This theory is very easily evaluated because we just look at the longevity of the population. That's all I'm trying to predict here. As medical science improves, longevity is plateauing. And in many countries like the United States, longevity is actually beginning to fall. So how can longevity, meaning the, the lo length of time the average person lives, how can that be falling when our medical science is getting better and better and better? And the, the answer is a little complicated, which is why I have to make a whole video. Uh, and before I dive into it, I have to uh, uh, make a disclosure here. I am the product, I am standing here as the product of medical science. Last year, in July, I learned I had massive cancer throughout my, my body, a form of cancer called lymphoma which is a uh, cancer of the blood, which is all out, all throughout the body. And when they took a scan of my body in July, there was cancer everywhere. After five and a half months of treatment and over 87 days in the hospital, my cancer was cured, or the best uh, that one can hope for. There's no cancer detectable in my body right now. It could always come back, but at least I have a few more, uh, few more years to live. So you would think I would be grateful, and I am. Actually, my cancer was, the whole experience was wonderful. I know that sounds crazy, but I enjoyed the people I worked with. Uh, my insurance paid nearly all of, of the expenses of my cancer, and I survived. So I, I am a success story of the medical profession. And the thing that someone like me might do after they survive cancer, is give all my wealth to cancer research. Now, I have no wealth to give, but if I did, I would not be giving it to cancer research, in spite of the fact that I'm a survivor because of cancer research. Because I think there are more important things to give your money to, things that will save more lives than cancer research will. I call this the health science paradox. And the health science paradox says that as, as health science improves, longevity is going to fall. At the very least, it will level out and it will not increase anymore and it very well could fall almost as a direct result of medical science getting better. So how can I say that? Let me first talk about the history of medical care, the history of medical science. And it, it almost all took place in the 20th century. So at the beginning of the 20th century, doctors really didn't have any tools. They didn't have things like anesthesia. They really couldn't do much for you. They could just kind of, a doctor would come in, he'd listen to your heart and say, well, I think you're a goner. That's about all the doctors could do as of 1900. As of the year 2000, we're saving people from all sorts of diseases. We're saving them from heart disease and cancer and, and all these things that people used to die young from. By the year 2000, we had licked. We had licked a great number of those diseases. Uh, and that accounts for, in part, for why the population grew so fast in the 20th century. Uh, it's not just that more babies were born in the 20th century but people lived longer in the 20th century. In many, in many countries, the, the average longevity, the average uh, length of life went from 50 years old to 80 years old. That's about what happened in Japan. 
over the course of the 20th century, people would die on average in their 40s. And by the end of the 20th century, they were dying in their 80s. So you can't say that medical science hasn't had an effect in the past. I'm just saying that from 2000 on, medical science is a mixed bag. What were the most significant medical advances that saved the most lives in the 20th century? Was it, um, was it finding cures for heart disease? Was it, uh, was it going in and operating and, and bypassing heart valves and things like that? No. The, mo the most profitable uh, medical advance of the 20th century was simple sanitation being able to provide clean water to people, being able to provide safe food. These things saved millions of lives. Balanced nutrition, just, just people getting enough food and getting a, a variety of food, which happened in the 20th century. Uh, that also saved lives because you could get vegetables now in winter. You can get fruit and vegetables now in winter, which you couldn't get in the 19th century, in the 18th century. So this balanced diet also saved lives. Now we get into things that medical science uh, has actually done, and that's vaccines. Being able to vaccinate children against common diseases saved millions of lives. And uh, health education. Back in the 1950s and 1960s, everyone was smoking, and sm uh, cigarette companies told them people that it was healthy. So we learned in the 60s that it wasn't healthy. And uh, after a lot of debate, the government uh, started uh, forcing the cigarette makers to put warning labels on their, cig their product. Uh, it started advertising campaigns to tell people how dangerous smoking was. Uh, all of that saved millions of lives. Uh, seat belts in cars saved millions of lives, prevented people from ever needing medical care. So these, these four or five things, very substantial, not very costly, saving many, many lives. Those are the most effective medical uh, advances in all of human history. So now that we've done all these things, what have we done like in the second half of the, of the 20th century? Well, we got into interventional medicine where someone has already gotten sick and you try to save them. So we came up with antibiotics for that. We came up with surgery for heart problems. We came up with chemotherapy for cancer. So all of these are interventional methods. How they differ from those earlier methods is they're very expensive and they don't save quite so many lives. So a lot of lives have been saved by open heart surgery, but relatively speaking, not as many people have been saved by those methods than by basic sanitation. So what you see here is, is science picking off the low-hanging fruit. It, once we've invented medical science, uh, then the first thing science does is, is it picks the easy things, and it tackles the easy things like nutrition and sanitation and tackles those first and gets a big benefit from that. But we have a law of greater cost going on here. As we pick off the low-hanging fruit, we're left with the more difficult diseases, like, uh, like difficult forms of cancer, uh, that where, where we're spending a lot of money to save relatively few people. So you can see what medical progress, medical science is doing naturally on its own is that it's reaching it's slowing down. It's not save each new advance saves fewer and fewer people and at greater and greater cost. The bill for my cancer treatment sent to my insurance company was over a half million dollars. My insurance company put out over a half million dollars for me to save my life. I'm grateful for that. I feel like I've won the lottery for that. But can you imagine a health system trying to put out a half million dollars for every single patient? No economy can honestly support that. So what happens as we get uh, saving more and more people, we're sending them bigger and bigger bills. 
and that means higher and higher insurance premiums. Or if you have a universal nationwide healthcare system, that means higher and higher taxes to try to support this health system. And eventually you reach a limit. You cannot spend a half million dollars on every citizen. There isn't a limited pool of money that can be spent on medical care. And the more we advance our medical system, the more money is spent on high value patients and the less money is spent on basic things like prevention. This may help explain why longevity is peaking and why it's, it's reached a plateau and in the United States it's actually falling. It may be falling in part because we were skimping on preventive medicine because these high value patients take up so much money. Uh, we're, the qu people's quality of life may be deteriorating because they are spending so much on medical care. The fact that you're spending so much money on health care means you are taking it away from other things. And it is this taking away from other things that is causing the damage and bringing down our longevity. In other words, if a, if a privileged few got to spend a half million or a million dollars on their health care, other people have to suffer one way or another. Back in the old days, let's say the middle of the 20th century and earlier, if you got a heart attack, you died, period, end of story. Today you get a heart attack, you're gonna be saved probably, but it's a very expensive saving going into the emergency room and, and their, all their interventions that try to save you, the bypass surgery, things like that, that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. And since they have saved your life, you are now a lifelong consumer of medical services because from now on for the rest of your life, you're gonna spend a lot more on healthcare. You might have a second heart attack. You have to be saved from that. The insurance company puts out more money for that. A third heart attack. You keep going until you as a patient have spent a whole lot of society's resources. Um, whereas in the old days, people just died and stopped, uh, stopped spending society's money. Now they are saved and they continue to live and continue to spend more money. And this money adds up. That's why the Medicare system is in such deep trouble in America, is that now that we're saving more people, we're guaranteeing l larger medical costs in the, per in the, in the future. And the, the more medical advances come along, the greater the cost to Medicare is going to be, both for their medical care and for the fact that they're gonna be living longer and have more time to spend money on medical care. Ultimately, this money has to come from somewhere. It has to come from higher insurance premiums or higher taxes or uh, simply the fact that fewer people are going to get medical care. That's probably the biggest danger is that, yes, people like me get, get the full treatment, get, get superior care, but that means indirectly that somebody else in society is not going to get any care at all because they can't afford health insurance or they don't have access to a doctor. The problem with modern medicine is that it is a perfect, it is a perfect profession. There can be no compromise in medicine. Once you're taken into the hospital, they have to follow all the right procedures of sanitation and providing the right tests to deal with your condition. They can't make any compromises. And because they can't make any compromises, once you're taken into the system, you get perfect care. But it means that less people on the long run are going to have access to the sim system. So here's something I learned when I was in the hospital. I was very fortunate to be in a ward that specialized in the kind of cancer that I had, where doctors had the experience to deal with my disease. When I walk up and down the hallways of this ward, I see that most of the people in these rooms are elderly. They're in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. And many of them are very frail. Many of them clearly are going to die anyway. Cancer just happens to be the disease that 
takes them out. In the old days, people used to die of, quote, old age. Now they die of specific causes. They die of heart disease, heart failure, or cancer or something. And cancer is one of those things that takes out a lot of old people. The thing is, the, the half million dollars that was dumped into me, relatively young person, is also dumped into an 80 year old with no discrimination whatsoever. In other words, a 20 year old with his whole life ahead of him gets exactly the same treatment as an 80 year old and receives exactly the same resources as an 80 year old. The 80 year old in all likelihood has multiple things wrong with them. So even if you save them from cancer, something else is gonna kill them. It's like we're dumping all this resources into the old people while the young people get nothing better, got, get nothing more. They get no, no better treatment because the medical system can't discriminate. It, the medical system today is incapable of triage. Triage refers to the sorting of patients uh, to try to maximize outcomes. The triage might happen on the battlefield in, uh, in a, a battlefield hospital where you have a lot of injured soldiers coming into the hospital and not many doctors, and not many medical resources. Someone called the triage nurse has to decide who's gonna get treated, who's gonna get treated right away. And it's a balance between saving people and letting people go. Uh, in a triage situation, you're gonna take, um, you're gonna look at the most wounded soldier the guy who's going to die anyway, and you're going to set him aside because there's no point in wasting resources on that guy who's probably going to die anyway. And there's no sense in wasting resources on someone who's probably going to live anyway. Uh, you can just set him aside for a while. You're going to concentrate on that middle range of patients who can benefit most from the limited medical resources available. So that's how things work on the battlefield and people live and die based on what this triage nurse decides. In modern medicine, we're, doctors aren't allowed to do that. Doctors and nurses cannot practice triage in a modern hospital, especially in the United States. You can't say that one guy is full of bullet holes, one guy is all shot up and probably won't live. Well, we're not gonna treat him. You're gonna treat him, you know, you're gonna throw all of your resources into that heavily injured fellow uh, because you're required to, essentially under law. Because if you don't do everything you possibly can to try to save a patient, our fine lawyers of America are gonna sue the pants off you if you neglect this patient in any way. So every single patient who comes into the medical system has to get optimal treatment which ultimately is unsustainable. Ultimately, it means a lot fewer people are gonna get into the medical system at all. It is not allowed to practice triage. It is not allowed to make value judgments about who is more worthwhile and more worth saving. It just has to give perfect treatment to everyone. And with every medical advance now, you're increasing those costs. Every new advance in, in um, cancer treatment means greater cost, not only for the treatment, but for by extending the life of this 80 year old. So he lives five years longer and can consume five years more of medical resources. The medical profession has become this like this giant monster that is absorbing more and more of our economic output. It's already the biggest, it's already the biggest industry in the country and probably the world, and it's getting bigger and bigger, and it will continue to get bigger and bigger until it support, until it absorbs all of the resources that are available to it. It's an insatiable monster. So in the long run, this can only lend, lead to fewer people getting medical care to begin with. Uh, one of the problems of, one of the, the benefits of my hospital is you had a lot of, uh, a lot of 
experienced doctors, the best doctors in the world were at my hospital in Boston. Uh, half of my doctors were, were foreign born, but they're being sucked away from other countries where they, they cannot, they're not serving. A, a doctor who, from India who comes to Boston to serve in one of our hospitals here, he's not serving the people of India, which means ultimately they, the people of India are getting less medical care and more Indians are going to die because of this great brain drain. There, there are other things that I can go into about how each advance in medical science results in a corresponding cost uh, that, uh, to society that ultimately kills people. What is killing people today is uh, what is really, according to the CDC, what's really accounting for the, the, our loss of longevity is uh, suicide and drug abuse. That's what's killing people. And which means that in some way we, we're skimping on our preventative measures, the things that prevent suicide and prevent drug abuse. We're not doing those things to, because all of our resources are sucked up by intervention and dumping millions of dollars into people like me. So what's the solution? And I don't have one. The goal of this video is just to describe the problem. Uh, the only practical thing is if you're going to give money to some medical cause, maybe something like cancer isn't the best place to give your money. I know that sounds like sacrilege. I'm saying don't give your money to things like breast cancer research or cardiovascular research because it is taking money away from basic services like nutrition and sanitation and suicide prevention and drug abuse prevention where you can get a lot more bang for your buck. You know, you dump a million dollars into cancer research. What does that buy? That buys a test tube is what it buys. It buys one, some trivial little part of the whole cancer research program. You take a million dollars, you you dump it into basic sanitation in some third world country and you're going to right away save thousands of lives. I don't know how do we get out of this. There, there is no, I mean you can't ask a government to uh, or doctors to decide who should live and who should die. That just isn't, that just isn't possible. Doctors have this Hippocratic oath that says they have to serve everybody. And they're not going to decide, okay, you're a young person, I'm going to put more attention on you. You're an old person, I'm going to let you die. No one is allowed to do that. So the whole system just gets more and more bloated until in one way or another it collapses or a lot fewer people end up getting medical care, getting, being able to get into the hospital at all. I don't know how you solve it. I just hope that I have in some way described the problem the problem is the medical science paradox. The more you put into research, the greater the advances you make in medical science, the more people you kill. I'm in Maine, down Maine. Lighthouse. This is the Noble, Noble Light, Noble, Noble Lighthouse. Very famous, often photographed. And I've got another four cameras on this shoot. You want to count them? There's one camera. There's two cameras. There's three cameras. And four cameras right over there. I'm going to do a clap. 